Welcome to episode 164 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Scott Curtis, who served in the FBI for 22 years. In this episode, Scott reviews a public corruption investigation that convicted Allentown, Pennsylvania Mayor Ed Pawlowski, as well as a dozen other public officials and business executives for campaign contribution bribery, extortion, and other corruption-related offenses. Scott Curtis spent most of his career assigned to the New York field office, working on an organized crime squad investigating the Colombo Elsian family before transferring to the Allentown Resident Agency out of the Philadelphia Division. Scott Curtis is currently employed as an Associate Director of Global Investigations and Compliance for Navigant Consulting, where he is responsible for conducting investigations of fraud, corruption, and other misconduct. This episode is a little bit longer than usual, but that's because, as you know, I love these white-collar corruption and fraud cases. Towards the end of the interview, Scott and I had a very interesting conversation about the expectation of jurors and the public that there be recordings, both video and audio, as part of the evidence presented at trial. I actually learned about new procedures the FBI has about custodial interviews, which means I'm going to have to change a section of my soon-to-be-published book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. Before we get to the interview, I want to thank a listener on Podbeam, I'm sorry I forgot to get your name, but who let me know that the Barbara Jean Mackle case was actually made into a TV movie, 83 Hours Till Dawn. So I've added a link to the episode show notes in case you want to watch it on Amazon Prime. If you do, let me know if the movie's any good. The main thing that I need to let you know is that my May Reader Team email will be going out either on Thursday, May the 2nd, or Friday, May the 3rd. In this month's email, I review the TV series, The Americans, which I binge-watched over the month of April, all six seasons. And I also have a few links to a couple of new crime fiction, true crime podcast and TV series that came out this month. So please look out for my May Reader Team email. If you don't see it in your inbox by Friday, please check your spam filter. And once you get it, why don't you add me to your contacts or send me a reply email. That way your email provider knows that you want to hear from me. If you're not a member of my Reader Team, all you need to do to join is go to my website, jerrywilliams.com and sign up there. Or you can actually sign up using the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. When you join my reader team, you'll get the FBI Reality Checklist, 20 Top Clichés About the FBI in Books, TV, and Movies. And you'll also get my FBI Reading Resource, which is a colorful list of books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been on this podcast. Crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. There are nearly 50 books listed. Thanks for listening. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Scott Curtis. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Now, I don't even remember how we became introduced to each other, but when I heard that you were the case agent on the Mayor Ed Palowski case, I was so excited because being in the Philadelphia area, I've been following that case through the Philadelphia Inquirer, and actually, a friend of mine, another former Bureau employee, Neil Schiff, would send me articles about the case because he knew that I really loved hearing about all kinds of white-collar cases, especially public corruption cases. 
And plus the fact, you know, I utilized uh, several retired FBI agents that you know, right, from the uh, the Philadelphia division to help, you know, monitor my Title Threes and uh, review consensual recordings that, you know, greatly enhanced uh, this investigation along the way. Now, I'm going to throw you a trick question. Why is it that the FBI is uniquely skilled in public corruption cases? I think a lot of times people are surprised that the FBI is interested in a local mayor. Well, part of the problem is the, the local and the state authorities are going to be sometimes apprehensive about investigating public corruption because of the local DAs, the state attorney general's offices, unfortunately have drifted into a more political environment. And so they're going to be hesitant to get involved in investigating, you know, local and state elected officials that at a minimum may create some kind of conflict of interest for them. Now that's definitely understandable. All right. So on this particular case, did you want to start first with letting people know a little bit about Allentown, Pennsylvania? I think that might be helpful. Yeah. So Allentown is similar to a lot of the East Coast, Midwest, Rust Belt cities that enjoyed a industrial and manufacturing past, which, you know, evaporated over time, beginning probably in the 1970s. And nothing was able to replace the manufacturing and and commercial businesses that those cities had. So Allentown, like those other cities, had a central business district that was primarily vacant. And so there were discussions about how we can revitalize this city. So that's where a uh, a state legislation was proposed and passed in 2011 to create a tax incentive uh, opportunity where tax dollars that were generated within this special zone that was created would basically be boomeranged back to the city of Allentown to help, help pay down a lot of the loans that would be required to take out in order to conduct this redevelopment in the first place. So Allentown, you know, is the, is the third largest city in Pennsylvania, but, you know, it had fallen on hard times. And so this economic opportunity was proposed and passed by the state. And that unfortunately also created the opportunity for public officials to use this influx of public money into the city for their own personal benefit to either improve themselves financially or politically. And was the main purpose of this funding to bring new industry into the area? It it was to make it easier for developers to finance development projects. And the hub of this redevelopment was a minor league hockey arena the AAA franchise for the Philadelphia Flyers was looking for a new home for their AAA franchise. And so they presented it a opportunity for Allentown to build an arena, you know, like an 8,000 plus seat arena. Uh, That would be the hub or the, or the, or the, the main focus of this redevelopment. And so this tax incentive opportunity would make it easier for the develop the, the developers to pay down the financing that they would need in order to initiate this redevelopment. All right, so I can already see where the problem is, and that is in the decision as to who's going to get this money. Right. It right from the start, there were news articles highlighting some of the preferential treatment that appeared to be going on. Part of this focus also spotlighted this consulting firm that was uh, based in in Allentown, which was run by an individual named Mike Fleck, who also happened to be the campaign manager for Mayor Ed Pulowski over the years and was also his best friend. So it created this very apparent conflict of interest where this consulting company that was involved in the political consulting, the campaign financing of the mayor of Allentown, was also involved in consulting for businesses and developers who were looking to get uh, contracts uh, within the city. 
Yeah, I can definitely see the uh, the conflict of interest there. A friend of Ed situation. Yeah, you know, these, these articles would point out the fact that certain people were getting contracts, certain people were getting approvals, and those same individuals were highlighted as being donors to Ed Pulaski's uh, mayoral campaigns, uh, which is, you know, publicly available information. And some of these reporters in the area were doing some due diligence to identify the fact that a lot of the significant donors were also getting something in return, getting assistance from the mayor of Allentown. Now that in itself does not prove that bribery, right, or, or any corruption related activity was going on, but it definitely showed that there was some conflict of interest and some ethical violations going on that needed to be further scrutinized. And whose decision was that to scrutinize it on a criminal basis? I mean, the, as you had just mentioned, journalists were questioning it. At, at what time did you begin to look at it? Did the FBI decide they, they wanted to look at it? Well, when I showed up in Allentown in March of 2013, you know, my initial marching orders uh, that I was given was the fact that there were a lot of these stories going around, a lot of rumors going around, that there were corruption-related activities going on in Allentown. There was no case opened up, no criminal case opened up at that time. There was you know, just a gathering of intelligence at this point. And so I was instructed to see if I could find enough evidence and information to, number one, justify and predicate a criminal investigation. And then from there, you utilize whatever investigative techniques I could to try to gather evidence to prove that there was corruption-related activities going on. So, you know, part of this process that I got myself involved in, I had to do a lot of quick learning and develop this institutional knowledge about who the individuals who may be involved in this corruption activity were, also identify and, and also research, you know, how the city was set up, how the city operated, how this neighborhood improvement zone, which is the tax incentive zone that I previously mentioned, how that was set up, how that was supposed to be conducted and orchestrated. And from there to try to also you know, do some surgical interviews of individuals who may have an incentive to cooperate with this investigation and give me some additional intelligence about the conflict of interest or evidence that they may have heard or witnessed that would prove that some corruption related activity was going on. I was lucky in the sense here, and every case has a little bit of luck involved in order to be successful. And in one of the interviews that I did of a city employee, that city employee actually went back and told the city solicitor that, I, that the FBI had showed up at their house to interview them. And that city solicitor decided to bury that information and not tell a, um, Ed Pulaski about the, the fact that the FBI was inquiring about things. If that solicitor had done something different and told the mayor at that point, the investigation may not have gone any further at that point. So, you know, again, that, that was um, a bit of luck that helped, you know, move this investigation along. The other bit of luck that was involved here was the fact that Allentown being an RA, we had uh, task force members uh, that worked in our office. And one of these task force individuals had a confidential source who was well aware of the, the news stories and the conflict of interest that were being highlighted in Allentown, volunteered the fact that he could be introduced to a public official in the area who could potentially make an introduction to Mike Fleck and his business. So armed with that information, you know, we uh, debriefed that source and he agreed to wear a recording device for us and had discussions with that public official who he was friendly with. And that public official agreed to introduce the source to Mike Fleck and his partner at the time, an individual named Sam Rucklowitz. So that introduction happened probably within the first two months of the investigation. Once we knew that we could get this introduction to Mike Fleck and his business and understanding the importance that Mike Fleck and his consulting company had 
with the mayor of Allentown and the significance of their involvement in potential corruption that was going on in the area, uh, we started formulating an undercover operation to have an undercover agent act as a potential developer for Allentown and have this source introduce the undercover agent to Mike Fleck and his company with the hopes that uh, Mike Fleck would facilitate a potential project and take the steps necessary to introduce the undercover to the mayor of Allentown and come to some quid pro quo agreement where they would require the undercover to provide something of value to the mayor. And in return, the mayor through Mike Fleck would facilitate this redevelopment. We started, you know, working toward this plan, this operation there. Uh, Mike Fleck and his, uh, and his business were happy to engage the undercover and, and take, take uh, a monthly payment and consulting fees, but they always seemed to keep the undercover at arm's length. They didn't want to bring the undercover around and have the undercover interact with the mayor directly. And then I was also hampered by constraints by the Bureau, which I didn't understand initially was going to happen in the fact that we weren't going to be allowed to, number one, purchase property, which we would need in order to do a a redevelopment project, and to also bid on any redevelopment projects there. So once I understood those that those constraints were going to hamper our ability to proceed in any project, I then shifted focus at that point to just developing probable cause to go up on a Title III on Mike Fleck's cell phone. All right, Scott, if you could explain why the Bureau prohibited you from purchasing property or even bidding on property. Because they didn't want to create a situation where innocent individuals potentially could be victimized or denied opportunity here. So we didn't want to put our undercover in a situation where the mayor and Mike Fleck were manipulating a process for the benefit of the government, essentially, and screwing over individuals who legitimately wanted to bid on purchasing the property or bidding on redevelopment projects. Understood. So at that point in the fall of 2013, my mission turned to, you know, developing probable cause to get a court authorized wiretap on Mike Fleck's cell phone, because it was also pretty clear by this point that Mike Fleck was what I would label as a weak link in the sense that he loved to talk a lot and he loved to broadcast what he was doing. He liked to promote what the mayor was doing and he, he liked to, uh, you know, highlight all the things that he was capable of doing to help others circumvent the system, circumvent the processes, you know, in exchange for, you know, their support of Mayor Ed Pulaski. So those people are are key in the sense that you're going to be able to maximize the evidence you're going to generate from any Title III wiretap there because they're not only going to incriminate themselves, but they're going to incriminate other other co-conspirators that are also involved in the in the, uh, in the illicit activities. So we were able to get up on a Title III in, on Mike Fleck's phone in uh, November of 2013. Unfortunately, you know, a little bad luck in the sense that Mike Fleck decided to change phones and change phone numbers within two weeks of us going up on the Title III wiretap. But we were quickly able to adjust and get the authorization for his new telephone, mainly because we still had the undercover agent and the original source interacting with Mike Fleck. And so whenever we needed to freshen up probable cause or generate probable cause, we would have them make phone calls or, or have face-to-face meetings with, uh, with Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz to help piece together the probable cause that we needed. Well, so that, let, me, let me ask you if you could just explain when you talk about authorization, if you could just give us a little bit of what that meant and the probable cause necessary in order to convince a judge you know, to authorize a, a, a wiretap. So to do a Title III wiretap of somebody's cell phone, you need two main components, right? You need to prove that that individual is engaged in criminal violations. And you need to also prove that he's utilizing that telephone 
in furtherance of those criminal violations. So how we were able to build and piece together the probable cause was in a handful of these face-to-face meetings, we had the sourced inquire, which he was able to do about, hey, you know, how can you help me, right? How can you help me in this process, in, in any redevelopment project? And how can the mayor help me? And what is the mayor going to expect in return, if anything? And what are you going to expect in return, if anything? And then we would then be able to follow up by telephone by unanswered questions during the face-to-face meetings or to help set up subsequent meetings or just to uh, reiterate some of those things that, um, that were discussed uh, face-to-face. So, you know, if you have the ability to um, have a source or an undercover agent make consensual recordings by telephone with a, a subject who you're looking to get court authorization to tap their phone, that's going to be significant probable cause in justifying with the court to get authorization. Right. And could you also just mention predication? Because you're going to have to show that the individuals that you are targeting were already predicated to do this, to participate in this type of activity. Yes. And this was, this was something a little bit different that I wasn't used to in New York. In New York, I work organized crime cases, which was a lot easier to predicate, right? Because those individuals, right, had a, hit, had a history of being involved in criminal activities. A lot of them had criminal records. So it was easier to show that these individuals, this is, this is their criminal past. This is some current source information about the activities they're involved in, and the case will be predicated and, and opened up. Here, you're dealing with individuals that have never been arrested before, never really been in trouble before, who are public officials that, from, for the most part, the public thinks, right, that they have these outstanding reputations. So it's a little more incumbent on you to prove that they're involved in some uh, nefarious activity. Again, we we started with the conflict of interest to show that just the general setup of their activities and and the way Mike Flex business was set up was inherently a conflict. And the fact that a lot of the business clients he had were turning around and making campaign contributions to elected officials who Mike Fleck also worked for in running their campaigns. Some of the other tools I used to help in the justification and the predication was, you know, like I said, I did some surgical interviews. One in particular that helped out significantly was a former client, political client of Mike Flex, who I had learned was not happy with the way that uh, Mike Fleck handled the campaign that was involved. I went and interviewed that individual and um, got some uh, information about how Mike Fleck conducted a political campaign and how Mike Fleck in the discussions in running this campaign connected political donations with the possibility of some official act that the elected official may be able to do at some point in the future. So establishing that connection is obviously another foundation of corrupt activities there because you want to say that there is this quid pro quo, right? This give and take that's involved with a, with a public official. Another thing that that interviewee provided me with was a canceled check that was used to pay Mike Fleck for services. So with that check, I was able to identify bank account information that Mike Fleck was utilizing. And then once I was able to predicate the investigation, get a grand jury investigation opened up and have subpoena, the ability to generate subpoenas, that was one of the first subpoenas that was generated to get the financial records for Mike Flex individual and business accounts. And through the just the, the financial aspect of things, just like with uh, most of uh, the FBI's investigations, you know, following the money is, is a, a key component of things because that's obviously what is really fueling the activity that's going on. And in, in this case, because the, the case centered around campaign contributions in exchange for official action, a lot of the, informa- the initial information we had about the campaign contributions was publicly available through the campaign finance reports that were filed. 
So those we could easily, even without predication in a grand jury investigation, you know, obtain those campaign finance records, review them, analyze them, schedule them out as if they were bank statements, and to identify suspicious activity, uh, patterns of activity there. And then once we were able to subpoena financial records that corresponded with those campaigns, then we, we were able to get the deposit information there on who exactly was making the contributions, match it up with the campaign finance reports, and also identify uh, leads for other financial records to pursue. So basically, you were looking for a kind of pay-to-play scheme. Right. That, you know, this quid pro quo involved the agreement to pay make payment in some form to an elected official, in this case, Mayor Pulowski, in exchange for the mayor taking official action. So you're paying for the ability for the elected official to take official action to benefit something that you're looking for that he has either direct or indirect authority over. Now, you had mentioned that retired agents were monitoring the the, the Title Three. Could you Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so running a Title III wiretap is a very labor-intensive operation because you have to, in order to abide by the law here, you have to monitor this in real time and you have to make a determination within two minutes or less that each conversation is pertinent or not. If it's not pertinent, you're required to minimize those. So in order to monitor somebody's cell phone who you know is using for potentially 16 to 20 hours a day, you need to have agents that are in the office that are monitoring the phone calls as as they are happening and are also skilled in the ability to identify whether these calls are pertinent to the investigation or not, minimize accordingly if they're not pertinent, and to also summarize each of the phone calls Uh, as they're happening. So me as the case agent can go back later on the next day and identify the most pertinent uh, conversations that occurred for further analysis for potential transcription. So number one, we can build probable cause for the next 30-day authorization because you only get 30 days of authorization per court order. And so by day 15 or 20 of that authorization, you have to start piecing together the affidavit for the next 30 days. And so on top of that, you're, you're also utilizing other investigative techniques to corroborate a lot of the conversations that you're intercepting on the wiretaps. So I learned that the Philadelphia division was utilizing retired agents to, to assist in monitoring Title Threes and other types of activities for to support investigations that were going on. And so I looked at that as a, as a huge multiplier for me in, in resources here because those retired agents would be available for multiple shifts every week. So that continuity also helped out because they would have a better understanding of the flow of the conversations there, they would know what was going on from one day to the next, and it would be easier for them to determine the pertinency of the conversations, as opposed to having an agent who was only sitting one or two shifts a week and basically in isolation here, not understanding what had been going on the previous days, try to make this determination about whether a phone call was pertinent or not. And, you know, so there were issues where some pertinent phone calls were, were minimized, unfortunately, because of this lack of continuity in the monitoring of the calls. So the Title III for Mike's Fleck uh, phone, you know, uh, developed a lot of good evidence, initial evidence of pay-to-play in Allentown. It identified some contracts that appeared to be rigged toward preferred vendors, um, you know, businesses that had agreed to make campaign contributions to Mayor Ed Pulowski. And it also identified illegal activities that Mike Fleck himself was involved in, including tax fraud and tax evasion, where he was uh, utilizing uh, his business accounts for personal expenses. He wasn't paying the necessary wage taxes 
for his employees, for his company. He was overinflating expenses that he was reporting on his tax returns. So, so that was good information to know when and if we made the decision that we would approach him at some point during the investigation, which I'll get into. A couple other things that stood out during this initial period where we were intercepting these phone calls, which I had clearly was in tune with, again, based on my organized crime experience in New York, but was a little surprised to encounter such conduct in the public corruption realm. And that was where they clearly were involved in counter surveillance, using code words to conceal uh, their activities, make it more difficult for law enforcement to intercept incriminating conversations, avoid talking about things on the telephone. One of the code words that was used was when uh, Mike Fleck and, and Ed Pulowski knew they were going down a road of potentially incriminating themselves in conduct that would show pay to play or bribery or, or extortion, would you throw out the code word of, we'll talk about it when we take the kids to school. And that was code for we'll get together in person to to further talk about whatever that conversation was uh, alluding to in terms of pay to play. Were they suspicious that law enforcement was after them or was this all related to the fact that that the media, that the newspaper was also generating complaints and accusations? They were aware of the, the the news stories for sure. They also took steps to try to misdirect the news to other areas. They also would supply fake news, right, about things they were doing or rationalize or justify things they were doing to, to try to push the news media off the scent of further scrutinizing their pay-to-play activities. But they clearly were also were paranoid that law enforcement could be investigating them. They had no direct knowledge at this point that law enforcement had an active investigation, but clearly they knew what they were doing was illegal. And so they were going to take the steps to try to insulate their activities and protect themselves from law enforcement intercepting any of the conversations they were having. Another aspect too, which caught my attention was the fact that Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz were happy to be the buffer and the insulation for Mayor Pulowski. And Mayor Pulowski obviously was using them for that purpose also to create this layer of separation so that the mayor himself could minimize his direct contact with individuals, especially individuals that they didn't thoroughly trust. And that's where we got this indication that we would never be in a, in a situation where they would thoroughly trust our undercover and even our our initial confidential source. So we knew we had to find other or utilize other techniques that would gather evidence we would need to prove that there was corruption going on besides this undercover operation that was initially proposed. So the Title III on Mike Fleck's cell phone continued into the spring of 2014. We also, you know, I identified the fact that Sam Rucklowitz, his partner at the consulting company, was an important player, and was also somebody that Mike Fleck used as a buffer and insulation for himself by communicating a lot of the intentions of the elected officials. So I decided that I also needed to get up on Stan Rucklowitz's cell phone because we were missing part of the story, part of the, the overall conversations that were going on in connecting campaign contributions to public contracts. So we started the Title III on Sam Rucklitz's phone in the spring of 2014. And just like I had guessed, you know, Mike Fleck would give him certain instructions. Sam Rucklitz would then go and communicate a lot of those instructions to the elected officials, including Mayor Plowski that they were working with, and to vendors who were also seeking public contracts in Allentown and, and, and elsewhere. Also, as a little side note here, we learned that the city of Reading and the mayor of the city of Reading was also involved in the same type of activity that was part of this overall investigation, but that's probably a discussion for another time um, because there was little caveats regarding that investigation that, you know, separate itself from what was going on in Allentown. By June of 2014, we decided we would take some action here to stir up some conversation on the Title Threes. 
which is, is important because like I explained, these are very labor intensive. So you, you know, you try to avoid having to utilize this technique for a significant extended period of time because of the amount of uh, manpower and resources that are, that are involved. So the, one of the things that we did is we knew that Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz and uh, Mayor Pulaski had used an inaugural and transition fund as another vehicle to another vehicle for pay to play, but a vehicle that was that made it harder for us to scrutinize this quid pro quo that was going on because these transition funds, unlike the campaign finance reports, they're not reportable. So anybody that was donating to this inaugural transition fund could do so and have some protection and some insulation in the sense that unless you had those bank records, you would not know that they had made those donations. But based on the wiretaps, we knew certain people, certain uh, companies that were making these campaign contributions, and some of them were looking for something in return from Mayor Ed Pulaski. So when you say they're not reportable, they don't have to fill out some document to send it into the to the government, but you still right. are able to to trace those funds because I take it a legitimate donors are still going to pay by check. True, but in order like but the newspaper would not know about this, would not have the ability to identify as a post as uh, you know that's what's different than a campaign contribution for a a campaign for elected official where those campaign finance reports are required and are publicly available. These transition funds, there's no requirement to report anywhere. Um, They're not available for the public. The only way that uh, anybody would know who was donating money and where the money was going would be if you had subpoena power and were able to subpoena those financial records, which obviously we were in the position to do. So once we learned about this through the Title III wiretaps, that was one of the leads that was generated through grand jury subpoenas to get those financial records. And when in analyzing and, and reviewing those records, we saw who was making campaign contributions and we were able to match up with conversations on the phone. Those individuals, those, those businesses were looking for some assistance. Some of them were looking for some assistance from Mayor Ed Pulaski. Also, Mike Fleck took a chunk of that money for himself as a bonus for running Mayor Ed Pulaski's most recent mayoral campaign. So we also looked at that as a potential area where we could scrutinize to see if he was going to actually claim that on his income taxes, right, as income. So one little facet of this that we didn't know about until we stirred up conversation was the fact that Sam Ruckelitz had embezzled money from this transition fund. And when we we conducted an interview of Ed Pulaski's wife because she was listed as the president of this inaugural and transition fund. And we also gave her a subpoena for all the documents and records for the fund. So when Mike Fleck learned about this interview and subpoena, one of the first calls he made was to Sam Rucklowitz to to let him know what was going on and um, because Sam Ruckowitz was the treasurer and in charge of all the, the, the records uh, regarding that fund. And through those conversations there, Sam Ruckowitz admitted to Mike Fleck that he embezzled some money from this fund. What also occurred during this time, which we had thought about doing, was approaching Sam Ruckowitz to gain his cooperation. And it just so happened during that week, Sam Ruckless had planned a trip out to San Francisco with his girlfriend to propose to her and to have a vacation. So we looked at that as as a good opportunity to approach him because he would be separated from Mike Fleck, from Ed Pulaski, and it would make it harder for him to consult with them after we approached him in, in asking them what to do and in tipping them off about the fact that the FBI was conducting an investigation. So that's something I utilized in the past too, was to create a good degree of separation there to give you a better chance at gaining the cooperation of somebody you were approaching. So don't tell me you approached him in San Francisco when he was going to be proposing to his girlfriend. It must have ruined the whole plan for him. Well, I, I, I did ruin the trip, but you know, I think now he would look back on it and say, basically, it was the best thing that could have happened to him. Okay. And, 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 we'll, and we'll follow up uh, with the reasons why later on. 
So yeah, I, I flew out to San Francisco, checked into the same hotel that he was that I knew he was at. Part of any plan to approach somebody covertly, right, about cooperating with your investigation is to have some contingency plans in place. Because if that individual decides not to cooperate and decides to sound the alarm, right, the FBI is conducting an investigation, you want to make sure that you can obtain whatever evidence is available at that point to help your investigation, knowing that the covert stage of that investigation is probably over. So what we plan to do as a part of this contingency was to get warrants to search Allentown City Hall, Mike Flex office, and several other locations in the event that Sam Rucklowitz told us that he didn't want to cooperate and that he was going to notify Mike Fleck and, and Ed Pulowski that the FBI was conducting this investigation. So obviously that required a lot of resources also. I think we had approximately 100 agents standing by to execute these searches in the event that Sam Rucklowitz told me that he wasn't going to cooperate. We also had uh, warrants to see Sam Rucklowitz's electronic devices that he had with him out in California, his laptop computer, his iPad, and his cellular telephone. Because again, if he, if he decided not to cooperate, we knew there was a good chance that a lot of that data was going to be deleted. And to prevent that, we wanted to seize those devices and have our computer resources there with the Bureau download all the data there so it was preserved. So we then could further review and analyze that to try to corroborate a lot of the evidence that we had obtained through other investigative techniques. So we planned this operation. We also had uh, an additional undercover agent involved in the scenario who was ironically situated out in, in California there. So we arranged for that undercover agent to have a lunch meeting with Sam Rucklowitz to get him apart from his girlfriend for a couple hours. And that's when we had planned to make the approach to try to gain his cooperation and to also seize his devices and download those, you know, as we were having this, this discussion with him about the benefits to him and his future, if he decided to cooperate as opposed to taking his chances and dealing with the potential ramifications of not cooperating. Unfortunately, the, the, the warrants didn't get signed in time. And so we had to restage everything for the following day to try and make a, another attempt to separate Sam Rucklowitz from his girlfriend because we didn't want her knowing what was going on either because we didn't trust that she would be able to contain this information. So we only wanted him to know what was going on and minimize the potential exposure of our investigation. So we, we cr I created another ruse the following day for the undercover agent to link up with Sam Rucklowitz again to ask for some documentation that Sam had promised him. And Sam Rucklowitz then had to proceed up to his room to get this data for the undercover agent. At that point, I knocked on the door and uh, identified myself. We uh, seized all his electronic devices. And I told Sam Rucklowitz at that point, I said, if you want to know any further information about what's going on here, I would recommend you follow me down to my, my hotel room here and I'll uh, give you additional details about what, what was going on. Luckily, he decided to cooperate within the first half hour of our discussion as I had uh, FBI personnel, you know, in the bathroom of my room downloading all the data from his electronic devices and trying to get this done in a timely manner before his girlfriend was suspicious as to why he had disappeared for this, uh, this period of time. So once he got back from California after that trip, you know, I instructed him that everything he was doing as part of his daily business with, with Mike Fleck and Air, Mayor Ed Pulowski and all the other people that were part of the consulting business, everything was going to be on tape. And so at that point in the investigation, basically Monday through Friday and sometimes on the weekends, I would be meeting him in the morning. We'd be going over his itinerary for the day. I would be giving him a recording device and turning it on. He would go about his business during the day and meeting with various business executives and elected officials in discussing, you know, a lot of pay-to-play activities and potential pay-to-play activities. And at the end of each day, I would link up with him, turn off the recording device, get a summary of who we met with and what was discussed. And then every day, those basically eight plus hours worth of recordings had to then be reviewed 
by somebody in the office to, again, identify pertinent conversations, to develop leads, to figure out how to follow up on certain discussions that were going on for the next conversations that Sam Rucklowitz could have. And so this was a, this was a, a daily process that went on for 13 plus months. I guess my, my question would be, I know you had contingencies in place just in case he turned you down, but you obviously had some type of confidence. You had confidence that you know, you had chosen the right person to, you know, ask about cooperation and that he would most likely do it. Why did you believe that? A couple factors, right? You, you want to identify what would motivate somebody to cooperate. And hopefully it's more than one motivation. In this instance here, there were a few different motivations that we identified through the Title III wiretaps. One the fact that he was involved in, in illegal activities. Number two, Mike Fleck really didn't treat him well, right, as a partner in this business. And in some regards, Mike Fleck was actually, you know, setting him up really to take the blame for a lot of the activities that were going on with, uh, with the, the pay-to-play conduct that was going on. And then number three, I think it also helped me in the fact that he is he was making this commitment to marry his girlfriend and that became his priority in life right as opposed to being loyal to mike fleck and ed pulowski well obviously you 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 chose well yeah i I had some reservations um just based on my experience usually and at this point sam ruckowitz was like 25 years old and in my experience you don't have a lot of luck with younger people trying to get them to cooperate because they're typically infatuated, enamored with this lifestyle that they're in. They enjoy it. They don't have other priorities in life as opposed to maybe people that are middle-aged who at that point are married, have kids, are looking at life a little bit differently. But again, I, I, you know, being able to, to have that intelligence about what Sam was experiencing at that point and also knowing that he was going to, you know, make this commitment to this girl that he was, he had been dating for several years was was motivation enough for him to say, you know what? I don't want to, I don't have any loyalty toward Mike Fleck and Mayor Ed Pulowski. I'm going to do what's necessary to protect myself and, and try to minimize my exposure and my punishment in what I've already done to this point. In those weeks and months that Sam was, uh, you know, making all these uh, recordings for us, again, a a very labor intensive process where, you know, I I had a very good um, intelligence analyst in the office who devoted his time to reviewing these recordings and and summarizing them for me on a daily basis, highlighting the pertinent uh, discussions that were going on. I also utilized the retired agents again to review a lot of these recordings. And and by this point, obviously, they already had a lot of the institutional knowledge about the investigation. And so when they were listening to these conversations on the potential recordings, it made more sense to them or better sense to them based on the the prior experience and the monitoring that they did on my Title III wiretaps. Um, So, you know, we developed a lot of good evidence of pay-to-play in Allentown, one of the things that we focused in a little more intently on was the fact that there were certain contracts, public contracts in Allentown that were rigged to preferred vendors. And I identified that as other related conduct that was associated to the bribery conspiracy that was going on and looked at it as a mail and wire fraud count because a lot of these companies that were bidding on these contracts would not have spent the time, money, and effort that was required to put together proposals and presentations if they had known that the contracts were predetermined toward a preferred vendor. So I looked at it as those competitors were defrauded by Mayor Ed Pulowski and Mike Fleck because Ed Pulowski's conduct and his decision to, to give the contract, to rig it to a vendor who had made a campaign contribution, was perpetrating fraud 
on any competitor that thought that this process was legitimate and that it was fair and an honest process. So we identified at least a half a dozen of these contracts that were being rigged to a preferred vendor. The, the one thing that everybody needed to understand with regards to this investigation is that these contracts do not happen overnight. They're not developed overnight. They're not uh, proposed overnight. They're not funded overnight. And the selection process that's involved doesn't happen in a day or two either. Some of these contracts had been in discussion for many months, some even before this investigation even began. And so we had to understand that in order to gather the evidence that would show the complete story from start to finish, that these contracts were predetermined to go to a specific vendor. And the reason was because that vendor had made a campaign contribution or given something else of value to the, to Mayor Ed Pulaski, that we had to understand that it could take many weeks and many months to intercept all the conversations related to that process. As this is going on, I was reading articles in the Philadelphia Inquirer And it seemed like it was going on forever, that there was a continuing list of of articles in the paper, and you were just waiting and waiting and waiting for the shoe to drop and, and someone to be charged. I'm wondering how this media attention affected your investigation. Well, before that happened, what had occurred as part of the covert phase was two things that helped accelerate this investigation. One was the fact that Ed Pulaski decided to run for United States Senate. And in making that decision, he decided that he would have to show that he had the ability to generate a lot of campaign contributions to be a viable candidate. Now, in order to do that, well, first of all, he established himself a goal of of raising a million dollars within the first 90 days of this campaign. Now, in order to accomplish that, he had to, number one, start putting pressure on vendors who had received contracts from the city of Allentown and demand that they reward him for the action that he took in getting them those contracts. And then the second part was any ability that Mayor Poklowski had at this point to approve or facilitate a new contract for a vendor in exchange for campaign contributions for Senate, he was going out of his way to accelerate that process. Now, we also, by March of 2015, decided that we would um, make a run at Mike Fleck in trying to get him to cooperate in this investigation. It was very clear that Mike Fleck was Ed Pulaski's best friend and his really his sole confidant in anything and everything that Mayor Pulaski was involved in. And um, so in order to close the loop on some of these schemes that we were involved in, we knew that we had to get these direct conversations that were going on between Mike Fleck and Ed Pulaski on tape. So again, we went through the same process of coming up with a plan, identifying motivating factors for Mike Fleck, where he would hopefully decide to cooperate having the contingency plans in place again, if he made the decision not to cooperate, to conduct searches to obtain all the relevant evidence that was out there before it was destroyed. So we set up a ruse with uh, Mike Flack where we had him show up at a diner for an, an alleged meeting with the original source of the investigation that we had. And we were waiting for him in the parking lot. We approached him, uh, identified ourselves and asked that he come down to uh, the hotel uh, down the street from that, uh, that location so we could explain to him what was going on and to hopefully get him to decide to cooperate in this investigation. Initially, he told us that he wanted to cooperate um, and he wanted to wear a wire. We fitted him with a recording device when he left the hotel that day. But as you know, part of the contingencies and, and the risk analysis that we did in doing this approach, we knew that we still had Sam Rucklewitz out there wearing a recording device. So Sam was our, basically our quality control out there to monitor what Mike Fleck was going to do after we approached him. And unfortunately, that initial 24-hour period, Mike Fleck went and told Sam Rucklewitz that the FBI had approached him 
and Mike Fleck wrote it down on a piece of paper that he was wearing a wire at that instance, and he wanted to have a meeting with Sam Rucklitz and another employee later that day to explain what was going on. And at that uh, later uh, that meeting later on that day, he told Sam Rucklitz the details about what had occurred. And again, Sam Rucklitz is wearing a recording device unbeknownst to Mike Fleck, so we were able to know exactly what was going on, and then we had to insert ourselves to confront Mike Fleck about what his actions were after he left us at the hotel without giving up Sam Rucklowitz as a source for us at that time. Uh, luckily, Mike decided to seek counsel. That, and once that attorney learned what was going on, that attorney reached out to the United States Attorney's Office and we set up the initial proffer session. And we were able to right the ship for the most part. And Mike Fleck was able to convert, covertly record conversations with uh, Ed Pulaski for about a three and a half month time period. And again, I, I take it you're doing this because Fleck in the past had insulated Pulaski from any other opportunities that you would have to record him. And so the only way to get Pulaski was to go through Fleck. Is, is that correct? Right. We understood the strongest incriminating conversations we were going to get were going to be between Mike Fleck and Ed Pulaski because Sam was a, a layer removed. We had some good conversations and we were building a good investigation, a good case at this point, but we knew if we wanted to solidify a lot of things that we would need to gain uh, Mike Fleck's cooperation and do it covertly where we could get these conversations on tape. And that coupled with the fact that Ed Pulaski decided to run for United States Senate, which again was fueling his desire, number one, to help vendors with contracts, but also fueling his desire to shake down vendors who previously got contracts for campaign contributions, created a lot of opportunity for explicit conversations between him and Mike Fleck. You know, basically, you know, identifying what actions the mayor had taken, right, to help these vendors out, and also having Ed Pulaski explicitly instruct Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz to confront vendors who were reluctant to make campaign contributions and pressure them into doing so. Do you have any examples of some of these conversations? Yeah, so one of the vendors that was involved was a law firm, Norris McLaughlin and Allentown who did a lot of legal work for the city of Allentown and for affiliated entities, these authorities that were part of the, the, the city's operations. And one of the attorneys at the law firm, an individual named Scott Allenson, wanted to be the point person at the law firm who would get credit for a lot of the work that was, a lot of legal work that was coming out of Allentown. And in exchange, he wanted to be the individual who the campaign contributions would flow through to Ed Pulaski so he could be in control of what was provided, what was provided in, um, in this thing of value to the mayor, and also get the credit for the legal work that was being generated by the city. So he was a little resistant to providing additional campaign contributions because he felt that Ed Pulaski had not rewarded his law firm with contracts that they thought that they were deserving of. He also thought that the fact that the city had a new solicitor in place now who was not friendly with their law firm, in his opinion, would also make it more difficult to get these future legal contracts. So one meeting that was recorded between Mike Flex, Sam Rucklowitz, and Mayor Ed Pulaski this was recorded by Sam Rucklowitz before Mike Fleck was cooperating, where this reluctance by Scott Allenson was explained to Ed Pulaski, and Ed Pulaski instructed Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz to confront that attorney, uh, Scott Allenson, about the fact that he should be willing to cough up whatever was asked of him in campaign contributions because that law firm had been given over a million dollars worth of legal work. And so Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz proceeded to carry out those instructions and conversations ensued for the next four months or so about getting Scott Allenson and, and his law firm to agree to make the campaign contributions and setting the foundation for future legal work that would be awarded to their law firm. 
Okay. Well, that's that's pretty clear of an arrangement of quid pro quo. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of one one thing that that sticks out in my mind was um, you know Scott Allenson advising on this recording here that he understood that you know law firms don't they don't get these contracts because they're good law firms or good attorneys, right? They're they're getting them because they're providing something in return, right, to to Mayor Ed Pulaski. So he was he was pretty explicit about this quid pro quo arrangement and you know what it would take to guarantee future legal work for their law firm. And you have that right on tape. Yes, it was very clear. These recordings were played during the, the six-week trial. And you know, Scott Allenson was convicted on both counts that he was charged with. And Ed Pulaski was, was convicted of 47 out of the 54 counts that he was charged with. So getting back to your previous question about the period of time between the covert phase of this investigation and the mayor being charged in an indictment. This was a period where, number one, we had to hastily pull the plug on the covert phase because the rumors of Mike Fleck cooperating were slowly circulating around Pennsylvania and the Lehigh Valley because that in that initial 24-hour period, like I mentioned, where he told Sam Rucklowitz, he also told another employee of his that the FBI approached him that individual slowly started leaking out this information about the approach and the FBI's involvement. Words slowly filtered back toward Ed Pulaski, and it culminated on July 2nd, 2015, in a, a breakfast meeting in Allentown between Mike Fleck, Ed Pulaski, and Fran Doherty, the uh, city's managing director there, where Mike was Mike Fleck was confronted about the fact that the rumors were going around that he had been approached by the FBI and was wearing a wire. Right after that meeting, Mayor Ed Pulaski, you know, followed him back to uh, Mike Fleck's office upstairs, and um, in the elevator, patted him down, looking for a recording device. And did he find anything? No. Okay. I, I, in 22 years, I never had anybody find the recording device that any of my sources were ever utilizing at that point. And that was part of planning this investigation was to develop devices that would not be easily recognizable or easily found. And so, you know, the mayor had no clue where the device was and he didn't find it. And so this exchange is, is also memorialized on a recording. Now, they're supposed to be best friends, right? Yes. So... I'm just wondering if Mike Fleck ever expressed to you if it was difficult for him to record his best friend. It was difficult. And that's what caused him to take those initial actions the first 24 hours by tipping off Sam Rucklowitz and this other employee because of that deep loyalty he had to Ed Pulaski. They vacationed together. They watched each other's kids. They interacted dozens of times every day. So we knew that it was a strong personal connection. It, was, it wasn't just a business or political connection here, but it was the, a very close personal connection. And so that loyalty was, was hard to, to overcome. Now, again, identifying motivations to convince Mike that it was better for him to cooperate here was the fact that it was, we, we had learned and it was clear that Ed Pulaski was very selfish and that if, if anybody was going to go down in an investigation, Ed Pulaski was going to turn and blame everything on Mike Fleck. And he was going to end up being the fall guy for this activity that was going on. And so I, you know, took the time to make it clear to Mike that he had a, he had a wife and he had a child and that should be his priority and not protecting Ed Pulaski. I'm looking at a particular transcript of the recording, and it's between, I guess, is SR. So that's Sam Rucklowitz. And uh, Ed Pulaski. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear <laughs> that he's, he's doing something illegal and that he is concerned that, you know, he's going to get caught. Yeah, well, there was a, there was a couple of, uh, a few of these conversations, which again, showed the intent, right, of Mayor Pulaski's activities, where he understood what he was doing was wrong. And so a couple of these instances, like this one uh, in particular here, where they had just finished meeting with a potential donor slash vendor, 
and we're looking to help him get a contract from the city in exchange for campaign contributions. You know, as they're leaving the uh, the meeting there, Sam Rucklowitz says, well, that went well. And Mayor Pulaski says, yeah, we got to be careful. I, I can't I can't get uncomfortable when we start talking about, hey, we're going to just give you this. Who has the contract process? I'm so scared nowadays, like who the hell knows who's wearing a wire, who's tapped, who's not. You know what I mean. I think I just got to be, we just got to be really careful when we talk about this stuff. So this happened on more than one occasion where he was paranoid about uh, law enforcement scrutinizing his activities and either using court authorized wiretaps to intercept his conversations or having people wear a wire, you know, recording conversations that they would have with Ed Pulaski. And again, the irony here is he's, he's saying this to Sam Ruckowitz, who is in fact wearing a wire. Yeah, very ironic. So after the covert phase of the investigation was terminated in, on July 2nd, 2015, you know, we had a lot of work to do in terms of reviewing a lot of the recordings that we had accumulated. We also executed on July 2nd searches of Allentown City Hall, uh, Mayor Ed Pulaski's house, a lot of electronic devices, computers, iPads, cellular telephones. So there was a lot of evidence and a lot of data that we needed to comb through to piece together the uh, criminal schemes that we believed were going on, which, you know, again, centered around the exchange of campaign contributions for public contracts. And as part of the agreement, right, to bribe Ed Pulaski was this conduct of rigging these contracts for these preferred vendors. So that took many months to go through. Also, I um, uh, was also approaching other individuals, other co-conspirators that we had evidence on and, and some good recordings on to try to gain their cooperation in the investigation, which included Fran Doherty, the managing director of the city, who I knew just from the organizational structure and the uh, contracting process in the city that just about everything flowed through him and that the mayor, again, used him as another person who could insulate conversations that the mayor didn't need to have directly with department heads within the city to ensure that these contracts went to the vendors that they predetermined. So I got Fran Doherty to cooperate. I got Mary Ellen Koval, who was the city controller. That position is supposed to be neutral and independent and is supposed to ensure that the city is following all the appropriate policies, procedures, and guidelines. But she was an elected official. She was also, her campaign was also run by Mike Fleck. She also used that relationship for her own benefit and was facilitating the activities of Mayor Ed Pulaski with her position there. So getting these other people to decide to cooperate who would corroborate a lot of the recordings that were made and corroborate a lot of the document and electronic data that we acquired through the searches to piece together good event matrices of each scheme which would have, you know, a combination of the recordings, any surveillances, documents, emails, text messages that would put together a, a pretty complete story that would show that that scheme was corrupt. And it was corrupt for these reasons. Either uh, a bribe was paid or, or the vendor was pressured to make a contribution, that the process uh, involving the public contract was rigged. This is how it was rigged. This is how competitors were misrepresented and defrauded as part of that process. So I'm wondering how they were able to do it because I had always assumed that for most municipalities, there were sealed bids for different projects, different developmental projects. Well, that's, that's how it, the process is supposed to be, right? The city has a procurement code and, as part of that code, there is a request for proposal process, and that process is supposed to be confidential, where you request bids from vendors, and those bids are supposed to be sealed and reviewed by a select committee confidentially, and that committee is supposed to evaluate those bids on their merit based on the qualifications outlined in the RFPs and select the best vendor for that project. Unfortunately, what was going on here was Fran Doherty in his role as managing director, he, he was the boss of every department head in the city. And a lot of these contracts were generated out of the public works department. 
where Fran Doherty uh, would inquire about the status of these projects and the RFP processes. And also, we had Mike Fleck was a consultant for the preferred vendor who was bidding on this project. And another individual who was also involved in this investigation, James Hickey, was also a business consultant. And during this one streetlight contract, he was the consultant for the preferred vendor who was ultimately awarded that LED streetlight contract. So they would get the inside information through Fran Doherty or through the consultants about the status of the process. And on a few instances, like especially with the streetlight contract, Jim Hickey working with the preferred vendor would actually write the request for proposal for the city. And with the ability to do that, they, would able, they were able to skew the request for proposal and eliminate most of the competition who wouldn't be able to qualify for the project in the first place. Now, the Public Works Department, they knew that there was this intention to, to rig the contract to this preferred vendor. They were not happy with that decision. They tried to alter the request for proposal once they got it from the consultant to Fran Doherty to their department. But Fran Doherty learned about that and uh, instructed them to rewrite it and send it out so that it could help this preferred vendor. So there was a lot of machinations that were going on to you know, facilitate the rigging of these contracts. Unfortunately, at times, you know, some people who didn't want to be caught up in this corrupt process were questioning what was going on. Those people ended up being key witnesses for us at trial, but Fran Doherty's position and his importance in things was able to control a lot of the activity that was going on and communicate a lot of the intentions of Mayor Ed Pulaski without the mayor having to directly communicate those to the uh, departments that were involved. Very sneaky. Yeah, you know, but again, we, you know, because of uh, utilizing all the sophisticated techniques at our disposal there, we were able to put together uh, a very complete investigation, mainly built on recordings, which showed the intent of Ed Pulaski and, you know, was very good evidence of connecting the exchange of campaign contributions for Ed Pulaski's official action in facilitating the awarding of public contracts to these vendors. And uh, clearly the, the jury, uh, a couple of them mentioned after the trial in news articles, highlighted the fact that because of these recordings, it was clear the connection between the exchange of campaign contributions for official action. Um, another thing that uh, we, we utilized in this investigation, which was the first time I had ever used it, and it was something that the Bureau recently implemented, was the ability to covertly record a non-custodial interview. Fairly recently, the Bureau finally enacted a policy of recording all custodial interviews, but this was one of the first times where we had the approval to covertly record a non-custodial interview. And you'll have to explain that more because I think on TV, you know, most people see law enforcement, police and state police, you know, they record interviews, but the FBI doesn't usually do that. No, for years, the, um, the, the FBI policies were, when you interviewed somebody, it was a process of taking notes and then summarizing the results of that interview in an FD302 summary report of that interview. The FBI did not record interviews at all. Like I said, um, it's, it's been um, probably within the last five, six years where they finally mandated that if you interview somebody who is under arrest, so in custody, that you have to now record that in, in custody interview or interrogation. But then it was af even after that where they gave us the ability to record covertly non-custodial interviews, which, again, I was a little hesitant to be involved in because I had been schooled, you know, for all number of years in, in just taking notes and summarizing that re those results of the interview in a report. But this actually paid huge dividends for us in the trial that resulted out of this investigation 
when we asked Ed Pulowski to come down to our office to be interviewed. He came down voluntarily. We explained to him, you know, that we were doing, we had been conducting an investigation. We asked him some questions and we kind of focused the investigation or, or the, the line of questioning toward Fran Doherty to kind of put Ed Pulowski at ease into thinking that Fran Doherty maybe was the primary focus of the investigation and not himself. And so for about a three hour period, Ed Pulowski's answering our questions as to the process that was going involved, uh, that was involved in, 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 in awarding contracts, uh, his relationship to vendors and to campaign contributors. And we were able to slowly weave our way down a road where we could then confront him about whether he had ever engaged in demanding bribes from vendors, demanding you know, campaign contributions in exchange for public contracts, um, involved in pay-to-play activities, involved in the rigging of contracts. And of course, we had all this evidence on tape, so we knew the answers to these questions unbeknownst to him. And so because we were recording this interview, there was no doubt about what he said to us in response to our questions. Whereas in the past, if we charge somebody with a thousand one, which you know people have been reading about in the news and other investigations has been utilized lately in, in charging people with making false statements to the FBI, in this instance here, the evidence was so strong because his answers were on tape. There was no doubt about what he said when we asked him whether he ever connected campaign contributions to city contracts, whether he ever demanded campaign contributions from anybody, whether he ever was involved in the rigging of contracts that the city had, had ever awarded. He denied his involvement in all of those questions. And we had obviously evidence to the contrary based on the consensual recordings made by Sam Ruckowitz and Mike Fleck. So clearly he was lying to us about his conduct. So we were able to charge him with seven counts of making false statements to the FBI as a result of us recording that interview. And I don't know if others caught, you know, what you said. This was covertly. So even during this interview, he knew you were taking notes and he definitely knew he was lying to you, but he did not know that you were also recording uh, his answers uh, electronically. Exactly. And that's what made the evidence so strong. Whereas in the past, if we didn't record an interview like that, we would have, to, the agents would have to get up on the witness stand and testify as to what he said. Now we could just have an agent go up there, give the backstory of how we conducted this interview, and then hit the play button and let the recording speak for itself as to who said what during the interview. Now, I will tell you that I'm, you know, I, I, I wasn't even aware of this. You know, I've, I've been retired for 10 years. And when I retired, I mean, these, these are the type of cases I did, economic uh, crime cases, fraud, uh, scams and schemes and things like that. And we did not record our conversations. Would you say, I mean, this is really uh, just really mind boggling to me. Would you say that the reason that the FBI has approved the recording of these conversations, that it's a sign of the times of people not being as um, <laughs> uh, I, I hate to use this word, but trusting of law enforcement in general and the FBI in, in particular. Well, I, I, I think the main thing here is, is I, this is the expectation now. You know, I think the days of, you know, any investigation where you're parading a bunch of witnesses in a trial to testify about events is probably in the past now. The expectation now is that you are going to have recordings, audio, video recordings of as much of the activity that was involved as possible. So the fact that we're now recording interviews, I think is just following along the lines of what the public expects of the type of evidence that we should have in presenting these cases at trial. And I guess, uh, you know, I can understand what you're saying because it really relates to also the body recorders that police wear now. Exactly. It, it, it just eliminates 
any doubt about what transpired. It also eliminates, right, or, or at least minimizes some defense argument about what actually occurred in giving their own theory about what occurred. Now there's, there's you know, little question if things are on tape about what happened. All you have to do is just, you have to show the recording and, um, and, and that's as complete of picture as you can present to somebody about what occurred. And so, you know, I, I, I learned that at some point in my career, probably in the early to mid 2000s, where getting as much as you can on tape, on recordings, was the key to any successful investigation because that was the strongest evidence you could, you could obtain. And in order to do that, you also had to think proactively. So if conduct was continuing to occur, you had to focus on that and being proactive about obtaining evidence. You know, historical cases are great if they're going to add to a proactive case that you can generate, but your focus should be on what's going on today and tomorrow and putting myself in the best position to obtain the best evidence of that, as opposed to trying to piece together something that happened in the past. Now, I could imagine if Mayor Pulowski is confronting Mike Fleck, you know, asking if he's wearing a wire, checking to see if he's wearing a wire, that the case is now going to be coming to a conclusion pretty quickly with the uh, main subject suspicious of your secondary target uh, who's, who's now cooperating. Yeah. You know, we had in the recordings obtained some suspicion of that in the, in the days preceding that. So we were anticipating having to pull the plug on the, the covert phase of things. And we're also planning on getting search warrants that we knew were important in, in gathering and, and in seizing any evidence that could corroborate what we had on tape at that point. There were also discussions on tape where Ed Pulowski was instructing Mike Fleck and Sam Rucklowitz to start deleting electronic communications that they had. So we knew that if we didn't act quickly, a lot of that evidence could be destroyed or deleted. And so it was important for us to execute those searches on July 2nd because that was a holiday weekend also. We knew if we, had, if we waited any longer by that next Monday, who knows what would have been destroyed or deleted at that point, which you know, could have affected the amount of evidence that was obtainable at that point. So you're not telling me that you made FBI employees work on a holiday weekend? Well, we, we, we executed these searches on July 2nd. The, the third was, I think, the Friday, which uh, was going to be the federal holiday for that year. So we had to scramble around a lot of resources to execute those, those searches on, you know, on that day. And we also, because we knew we wanted to interview Ed Pulowski, we didn't want to give him the opportunity to go consult with whoever about what he should do now that he had a pretty good idea that there was an investigation going on. And this is 2015 or 2016? 2015. So at that point, I take it everybody knows the media, I'm certain, is aware. The media is, always seems to be aware when the FBI conducts a, a search, especially at, at you know seat of government. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it took them a little bit to to know what was going on because we had to scramble around and put all this together at the last minute of this day before this holiday weekend. But, but slowly they learned what was going on. They, they then learned that uh, Mike Fleck had been cooperating. They started then, the media also started submitting their own right to know requests based on what they knew we were inquiring about or, or searching for in City Hall to try to then do their own investigation to see if they could guess and piece together what some of these schemes or what, of, what some of the crimes we were pursuing were. So you do a search on July of 2015. And when was it that you finally charged the mayor? July of 2017, so almost two years later. Right. And that's when I was, you know, still 
reading the paper and everybody's just waiting. What's going on? So could you answer that question? What are you doing during that two-year period? You know, again, reviewing a lot of the evidence that we acquired, interviewing a lot of people, trying to gain the cooperation of co-conspirators that we knew were involved. One other thing on a legal side that caused some delay was this uh, US v. McDonald decision, which was a public corruption case involving the governor of Virginia, where the Supreme Court threw out the convictions of uh, Governor McDonald there and more specifically defined what an official act you know should be when you're talking about a bribery scheme. So we had to uh, review that decision and make sure that our evidence was still strong enough to overcome this new definition that the Supreme Court had laid out for us, which it did, obviously, because, you know, we had a lot of these uh, uh, great recordings. Another thing that we did during this period, too, is we um, obtained a warrant to seize all the remaining campaign contributions out of uh, Mayor Pulaski's uh, campaign accounts, because I also realized as soon as we went overt in this investigation that he could utilize those campaign funds to pay for attorneys to defend himself in this investigation. So we wanted to minimize his opportunity to do that and cut off the funding there. So we got a warrant from the court to seize his his campaign contributions, which I think was one of the only or few times that that has ever occurred to. I would imagine, and I'm I'm sure you're going to address this, but I'm going to imagine that a lot of the defense, you know, especially friends and relatives of his who wanted to minimize his guilt, was that it doesn't appear that he used these funds for his personal gain. You know, he wasn't out there, and you can tell me if this is not true, but he wasn't out there buying cars and yachts and taking vacations, but he was using the bribe money that he got to fund his campaign. So he kind of did it more... Uh, to increase his power and his influence than he actually did it for personal gain. That's, what do you think about that? Yeah, that that's true. And that's why the bulk of the case centered around the exchange of campaign contributions for official action. You know, he had this desire for higher office and so wanted to utilize his position as mayor to set him up, set himself up to gain higher office. And in order to do that, he would need to cultivate right a lot of influential donors. And so he used his time at, as mayor of the city of Allentown to establish this relationship with people that he thought could help fund future campaigns for himself. Now, he did take things of value for personal gain throughout the investigation, and, and some of this uh, was presented at trial where He accepted tickets to Eagles playoff football games. He accepted a lot of free meals. I don't think he ever paid for a meal himself during the whole course of the investigation. He accepted vacation home down in Key West, Florida. So things like that, that he personally benefited from, he was willing to also accept. That just tells us that definitely campaign financing reform is needed. If this is what you have to do in order to get the money that you believe you need, it's unacceptable. Yeah, and it's it's not being made any easier, unfortunately, because now with, again, other Supreme Court, recent Supreme Court decisions, which is further enhancing the fact that this is a First Amendment right that you can donate money to whoever you choose, Now, on the federal level, there are limits as there are in other lower level municipalities, but people are going to find ways to circumvent those limits. And that's through these super PACs, through these independent expenditures, where they're going to find a way to finance a candidate, to influence a candidate, gain access to an elected official, even if it's not directly. And then the problem is that that candidate feels beholding to those entities, and now they get access and advantages that the regular people, the regular citizens, are not going to be able to obtain. And that's not fair. That's not democracy. No, it, it all begins with putting yourself in a position to get access. And then from there, a lot of times it progresses to the 
to the point where it becomes a quid pro quo, where it becomes a bribery scheme. And so, uh, like you said, people that have the money, that have the ability to finance a candidate or an elected official are going to have a benefit over people who don't have that ability. Now, basically, we've talked about three main people here, you know, Sam and Mike Flint and the mayor. But I understand that there were a number of people, uh, city employees and vendors, who were caught up in this bribery fraud scheme. Yeah, well, uh, within the city of Allentown, um, Mayor Ed Pulowski was convicted at trial, like I said, of 47 out of the 54 counts that we charged him with. Fran Doherty, the managing director, pled guilty, and, and he testified at trial against uh, Mayor Ed Pulowski. Uh, he pled to the rigging of that streetlight contract that I mentioned. Mary Ellen Colville was the city controller. She pled guilty to a bribery scheme, a pay-to-play scheme as, as part of this investigation. She did not testify during trial. Gary Strather, the finance director of the city of Allentown, was involved in rigging a delinquent tax collection contract for a preferred vendor at the direction of Mayor Ed Pulowski. And Dale Wiles, an assistant city solicitor, was on that evaluation committee of that delinquent tax collection contract. And Gary Strather and Dale Wiles rigged the contracting process for the vendor that Mayor Pulowski and Mike Fleck identified as uh, somebody that they wanted to receive that contract. So they they were all prosecuted as uh, city officials in the case. There were five uh, separate vendors. There was one developer that pled guilty as part of this investigation. Scott Allenson was convicted at trial as an attorney for the law firm Norse McLaughlin. Mike Fleck and Jim Hickey were consultants who would facilitate these pay-to-play schemes for Mayor Ed Pulowski as they were representing business clients who were uh, willing to make bribe payments to Mayor Pulowski in exchange for the mayor helping them get city contracts. And so what was the final sentencing? So Mayor Pulowski was sentenced to 15 years last year. He's currently um, serving his uh, term of incarceration right now as he's you know trying to appeal his conviction. Uh, Scott Allenson was sentenced, I think, to... I think the 24 or 30 months and he's out on appeal right now. So he was released on bail pending his appeal on his conviction. You provided me with this uh, really great chart of all of the people that were charged and, you know, what they received, you know, whether um, they pled guilty or, or whether they went to trial. I'll include this chart in the show notes for this episode in case any anybody's okay. interested in learning more about the individuals involved. Okay, no problem. Now, one of the things that I don't know if people listening have noticed, but if they've been calculating on their fingers, you started this case in 2013, and it, you didn't finish this case until 2018. So it was a five-year investigation. Yeah, but surprisingly, the shortest investigation I ever um, was involved in in my career. (laughs) Now, that's amazing. Yeah, I seem to always get myself involved in these long-term complex cases that involved, you know, multiple subjects committing multiple criminal schemes over multiple year time period and also involving subjects that were sophisticated criminals, right? So it was not easy to penetrate their sphere to get in a position where we could acquire, you know, good evidence on them. It took a lot of period of time to cultivate good sources that could then lead to the development of probable cause to then use a lot of uh, sophisticated techniques. And, And this case was no different. I think something that helped me out tremendously in this investigation was the fact that when I showed up out in Allentown in 2013, I already had 17 years of experience working these type of cases. I knew how to obviously conduct the investigation. I knew what was going to be involved in executing this investigation. It just was a matter of developing one or two good sources and getting that initial probable cause to 
get the authorization to start recording conversations. And I knew once I got to that point that I would be able to put together, you know, a very complete and good investigation at that point. And as you're investigating this particular case, there are so many other similar corruption cases, you know, with public officials going on in Pennsylvania at the same time, having to do with other mayors. Yeah, the the state treasurer Rob McCord was uh, was prosecuted during this time period. The mayor of Reading was part of this investigation here. There were also news stories about allegations of other elected officials being involved in corruption. And that's one thing I didn't know when I first showed up out of Pennsylvania about how corrupt the state was compared to other states in the union there. If it was like the fourth or fifth most corrupt state in the, in the country, believe it or not. I, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have laws that are favorable for a corrupt culture in the, in the fact that their campaign finance laws are so lax that you can make unlimited individual contributions to elected officials in Pennsylvania. You know, I think that just breeds this culture of corruption here. And, you know, what I learned through this investigation was that, you know, this, this was a culture that has been going on for years unchecked. And there's probably many more cases that could be developed in Pennsylvania. And hopefully this investigation will serve as a good example of what criminal activities are being perpetrated in Pennsylvania and how to go about, you know, investigating this type of activity. Yes, because at the same time in Philadelphia, the district attorney and a United States congressman were also being investigated. And again, a lot of it had to do with funds that they received from quote unquote friends that was later determined to have been a quid pro quo situation. Yeah, Shaka Fatah and Seth Williams were uh, investigated and prosecuted by uh, the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office for their involvement in um, similar type conduct involving, you know, pay to play bribery schemes, extortion schemes that were going on. Right. The Philadelphia office, because again, Allentown is a resident agency, as you mentioned, an RA out of Philadelphia. And so the Philadelphia division and their public corruption agents were definitely very, very busy <laughs> during this time period. Yeah. And there was, and there was a lot of uh, overlap in things. I mean, um, uh, there was things generated as part of my investigation that helped some of those other cases move forward. And there was, you know, leads and, and evidence generated in some of those other cases that, you know, helped in some of those other parallel investigations that were going on. So, you know, we needed to have some good coordination there because there was this overlap. Well, this has been fascinating talking to you about this because everybody who listens to FBI Retired Case File Review knows that I'm partial to white-collar crime cases. I don't know what it is about them, but it, uh, it, I always find them so fascinating. Other people may look at you know, a kidnapping case or organized crime case, but it's, it's, the, it's the corruption uh, and the frauds and the scams and the schemes that really, really get me excited. Yeah. And, and coming from the organized crime world, you know, I was a little hesitant at first that I would have the same satisfaction in working this type of, these type of violations here. But looking back on it, I probably experienced the same level of satisfaction, the same adrenaline rush during the investigation, right, of utilizing the same techniques and investigating this, you know, similar activity. It's just the, the, the subjects were a little bit different. But other than that, it was uh, planning and executing an investigation, no matter what the violation is, you know, the, the, the general framework is the same. You go about it the same way, you know, there's little nuances and caveats involved in, in every case. But if you look at it as going about it in, in the same fashion there, you'll be successful. Well, this has been a fascinating case review. But I do know that you were involved in an organized crime case where 120 individuals were indicted and arrested during the same period of time. I, I think it was considered one of the largest takedowns of an organized crime enterprise in the U.S. history. So I'm going to have to get you back on the show to talk about that. In, uh, in the near future, maybe in, in four or five months. Uh, how about that? 
Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. And um, again, you'll see a lot of the same uh, techniques, um, a lot of the same approaches that I utilize in that investigation help me develop that experience that I then applied out in Allentown starting in 2013. Well, I guess one of the things that we're all very curious about is, you know, your background. So I'm going to ask you one of my standard questions, and that is, when did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? I joined in 1996 to explain, you know, how I got interested in the FBI and how I got to that point of accepting that position. So I'm a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. And so when I graduated from there, I had a five-year commitment as an active duty uh, officer in the United States Army. So that was in the you know, early to mid-1990s where I was serving my active duty time. In 1995, as I was at Fort Benning with a lot of my peers in one of the military schools that was required, at that point, the Army was downsizing tremendously in the post-Cold War era there, and that was before 9-11, obviously. But the FBI had a big hiring push in 1995-96, as I'm sure you remember. And so that's where I first started hearing discussions about people uh, looking to apply to the FBI or, or having an interest in the FBI. Before that point, I had never even thought about it. I never knew an FBI agent and had no real desire to go into the FBI. But because I was serving this, this time in the Army and was invested in this public service, and then when I started doing some of the research and had discussions with my friends about the opportunities in the FBI, it seemed like a, a logical and, and an ideal transition for me to go from the military to the FBI. And so I started applying in 1995, and it took uh, you know, a little over a year to go through the whole process. And um, so I was able to sign out of the Army and then basically sign into the FBI in May of 1996. We've had a chance to hear a little bit about your career with the FBI. Now that you've retired, what are you doing? So, you know, I'm doing the same basic things I was doing in the FBI. I'm doing uh, white collar investigations, focusing on fraud, corruption, misconduct uh, investigations for a uh, worldwide consulting company called Navigant Consulting, where we do a lot of, uh, where we do work on the, for the public sector and for the private sector. So generally speaking, I'm doing the same type of activity that I was doing as an FBI agent. Obviously, I don't have the leverage that I had as a federal agent and don't have the ability to use some of those sophisticated techniques as part of my investigations that I did in the the FBI. But I'm conducting a lot of interviews, reviewing a lot of document and electronic uh, data and and evidence along those uh, lines there and piecing together to prove that white collar related activity is, is being perpetrated. So I always try to give my guest the last word, what would you like to say? Well, I would just hope that, you know, anybody that is listening to this podcast could use this case example as, as, you know, something to learn from, especially if people that are still out in law enforcement want to, you know, better understand, you know, what it takes, uh, what's entailed in a, in a complex investigation. And if, if anybody, you know, desires, uh, you know, contacting me, you know, with questions on how to, you know, conduct an investigation, and, and I'm still in contact with most of my cooperating witnesses over my entire career. And we'd be more than willing to, um, you know, share our experiences and help anybody out that, um, you know, so desires. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Scott Curtis. You'll also find links to several newspaper articles about the Mayor Ed Pulowski corruption case. Scott gave me an organizational chart to share with you, which has photos of every person charged and convicted in the investigation. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or anywhere you listen to audio. Soon you'll be able to pick up a copy of my first nonfiction book, 
FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. Coming soon to all stores where books are sold. It's a 55,000 word expanded version of my popular FBI reality checklist. If you enjoy police procedurals, I hope you also consider picking up copies of the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. The crime fiction series features Special Agent Carrie Wheeler, Temptation, Corruption and Redemption. The books are available as ebooks and paperbacks at Amazon.com and Pay to Play is also an audiobook. I want to thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.